Okay, so um, welcome. So the first piece that I wanted to um, speak uh, in, to do is to invite each of the folks that are, are kind of our topic guides. So that would be Neil, Julie, and Lucy. Um, and I'll start maybe with um, Neil. If you could just introduce yourself and um, say who you are, um, what you're doing, um, who you're working with, what's your connection with um, the United Church. And we'll just do a kind of really a kind of go, a first go round with folk introducing themselves and saying who they are. And then we'll come back and go a bit and go more in depth into projects that you're working on, um, what you're on the cusp of, what, what, what you can see down in, um, on the horizon. So um, Neil, I'll let you unmute yourself and then we can start if you can figure that out. Okay, so Neil, you're still muted. So there's a button along the bottom that says. Okay. I, think, I think, can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Um, this is my love bird, Obi, who will not be with us for long, but uh, anyway. So, um, hello. All of us in the guests have got a, um, a love of nature here, but that would sum up uh, why I'm talking to you today. Um, I'm a Methodist minister in the UK, arrived here 16 years ago, always lived in Montreal, and two and a half years ago, I began as a minister in um, Westmount Park United Church, having been a chaplain at McGill University. Um, and before then, I was a minister for nine and a half years uh, in NDG, just further west than Westmount. Westmount Park United Church is aptly named because it's right on the southwest corner of the park and I have a background of science. I was a zoologist before I was trained in theology and so I think things, all things have come together with a church situation that's quite weak in terms of numbers but strong in terms of the plants, what, what the, the building offers and where it is. Otherwise, it would have closed a long time ago. So average age of uh, 75 in the congregation, about 20 people in worship. Um, I started talking about doing faith in nature work. We have a monthly climate cafe, and we've just won a new ministries grant to extend my time and also employ somebody to, um, to work in what, we've created a unique space in the sanctuary for education on nature and the environment called a nature niche. I'll stop there, I think. Okay, thank you, Neil. I'm, all, I'm already completely intrigued, so that's very exciting. All right, um, Julie, would you like to go next? And if you unmute yourself, there's a button along, there you go, good job. All right, so, I'm with Keepers of the Athabasca, and uh, we're an indigenous-led, uh, not-for-profit environmental organization uh, in northern Alberta. Um, the Athabasca River runs all the way from the Rocky Mountains through Hinton, Edson, uh, the town of Athabasca itself, and uh, then up through uh, Fort McMurray area and to, the, to Fort Chipewyan. So our membership is all along the river and um, our connection with the United Church is that earlier this year, and I'm gonna be brave here and do a, a screen share. Earlier this year, we did, can you see that? We, oh, I can see what you're seeing. We did um, our first flowing into right relationship paddle and we put up our teepee called the Ogisigo Wapan, which means reaching for the spirit or translated into English, the skyscraper. <laughs> um, it's a 40 foot teepee, so it's very large. Can you see the teepee? No, actually oh. we're not seeing your screen at the moment. Um, oh, okay. Uh, there you go, now you've, there, thank you. Now you see it. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad that worked. <laughs> yeah, so we put that up for the first time on Canada Day uh, at the Magnificent River Rats Festival in um, Athabasca. 
we also had our paddlers. Can you see the paddlers? Uh, not yet. Okay. Um, what to do, what to do. You might need to click on the arrows to go to another image. I will just talk about them. I think my okay. braveness isn't working past the first step. <laughs> um, so we had uh, 11 paddlers uh, go on a three day voyage from Smith down the Athabasca and arrive at the River Rats Festival. We had the Drift Pile drummers uh, drum them in and uh, do an honor song as they were presented on the stage, which is what I was going to show you. But uh, in the interest of time, um, we'll just go on to say that we um, had a wonderful time and this is going to hopefully be an annual event now and uh, expand to include more paddlers and perhaps a longer route next year. Um, and our, our theme for flowing into right relationship is to, to make sure that the important work of understanding uh, Indigenous cultures um, gets done before reconciliation is attempted. We, we, we can't get to reconciliation until some of the uh, historic concerns and, and also what's going on on the land today uh, is addressed, that the elders have made it clear that reconciliation really depends on, on, on what happens on the land uh, going forward. So uh, that encompasses our work. We, we work very hard to uh, do things like uh, we're um, intervening in the proposed new uh, tech frontier bitumen mine, which is a, a new bitumen mine they're proposing north of the Firebag River, which is the, the line in the sand, so to speak, that the elders drew. So this is this project is uh, not acceptable and, and uh, w would not be uh, viewed as, it would be the opposite of reconciliation if it went ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, Lucy, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, give us a brief kind of overview of what you're doing? Okay, I think you turned off your video. Um, so you can turn your video back on and turn on. There. Voila. Okay, great. Sorry, guys. I'm on my cell phone again, so a little bit um, technologically incompetent. Um, my name is Lucy Cummings. I am uh, reaching you from my kitchen in Toronto. I am the executive director of, a, 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 we like to say lean but mean, um, not-for-profit called Faith and the Common. Um, some of you might know us as Greening Sacred Spaces. And we are a interfaith sustainability network. Um, we were actually started by two United Church ministers, um, Bill Phipps and Ted Reeves, about ten years ago. And um, uh, and 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 the purpose was to leverage the shared DNA that exists among uh, faith and spiritual communities across the country around uh, protecting Mother Earth and um, serving each other. And there was a feeling that um, we, um, there, there is so much positive, wonderful work being going, uh, ongoing in individual congregations and we need to do a better job to leverage this work um, in order to create um, what we hope um, will be a sea change in terms of our society and how we look at sustainability. Um, we do a lot of different projects. Um, I was trying to think of which one would be most interesting to focus on. Um, and I thought um, uh, we, we, we do everything from supporting community gardens to uh, renewable energy installation. Uh, we do a lot of um, interfaith advocacy work where we invite different faith communities to come together around different issues. Most recently um, in Toronto, Toronto in September, we were at the interfaith partner for the Great Lakes Water Walk. Um, Julie, your um, flowing into right relationships um, really resonated with me because we were working with Anishinaabe grandmothers um, 
and the uh, Nibia Masadamajig in Peterborough to do a ceremonial water walk along the Toronto waterfront. Um, and our role was to invite um, faith leaders um, from the, the four corners of different cultures, ethnicities, and religious backgrounds um, to participate um, in, in the celebration um, of water um, and um, for water protect faith-based water protectors to to come together with indigenous water protectors and and people from all walks of life to do this work so um, but but we do also um, uh, a lot of practical stuff in terms of energy efficiency and helping congregations save money um, and be better stewards of their of their building um, uh, we um, we're, we're about practical um, uh, practical projects rather than kind of sharing theologies uh, it's more about um, how can we support each other to do a, a better job of caring for the planet um, so one practical thing we 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 did um, uh, this year was a faith commuter challenge where we were encouraging faith communities to work together to lower their transport footprint. Um, and we had about 50 communities across the country participate. Um, and it included blessings of the bikes and transit cards and uh, and um, uh, 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 people blogging about how biking is a form of worship uh, or kind of a, a new way of, or the, the, the need to incorporate um, active transportation um, back and forth to, to worship and include that as a form of worship. Um, so, um, so I guess the, the, the bottom line, I, I guess it, um, I would maybe reiterate what um, something that Neil said at the beginning that um, that when we as faith communities participate in this kind of work, it, um, it strengthens our soul, um, it strengthen, strengthens our community um, because the, the, I, we find that the strongest projects are those where we work with a lot of diverse partners, both community-based and faith-based. And I think it, it, it strengthens our, um, uh, our ministry um, in, in that it really gets us out in, into the community um, and it helps us to be better stewards of the resources that we have. So um, I, I, I'll look forward to maybe talking about more specific stuff um, later on in the Q&A. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Lucy. So I'd like to kind of just pause at this point and um, uh, give an opportunity for um, Martin and Doug to um, introduce themselves and also say kind of what brings them onto this call today and uh, so that we can hear their voices at the beginning here as well. So um, Doug, would you like to introduce yourself and say um, who you are, where you're calling from and what brings you on the call today? Sure. Sure. Um, Doug Clark. I, I'm the uh, chair of the board of directors for uh, Camp Big Canoe, so uh, United Church Camp near Bracebridge in Ontario. Uh, we have, we're a tripping land-based camp, so we have a pretty strong environmental program and are very much uh, involved, interested in keeping it that way and interested in our environment. I'm also working with the board of the Friends of Muskoka Watershed as well on some projects to help uh, clean up the watershed, calcium declines, road salt, and those kinds of things. Um, so uh, I have that interest as well in green initiatives. Yeah. Great. Well, Doug, I'm really glad you're on the call because I know, I think you were on the call we did earlier about camps. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, one of the takeaways for me from that particular call was just the, I was surprised and shocked by the number of camps that are affiliated with the United Church of Canada, camp, camping sites, 63. Yeah, it's a pretty strong group, yeah. Amazing group. And I was just thinking about this whole um, re, rediscovery of our um, values and interest and call around our relationship with the land and just thinking what a huge asset those camps are as we kind of perhaps do this journey um, and was just wondering about about how camps perhaps 
might rediscover their role and place with, with that kind of an, an agenda or a call. Um, anyway, so that was a piece. So I'm really glad you're here um, and look forward to kind of how this plays out. So thank you. Um, thank you. Martin, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, Sarah, you already know me. <laughs> you know you. <laughs> I'm the minister at Hillcrest United Church in Montague, Prince Edward Island. I actually have another uh, smaller church as well in Sturgeon, Prince Edward Island. And I'm here because I live in a province that says it's the Green Island, but we still have many problems. And part of the problems have to do with corporate agriculture. And uh, I have a community garden here but uh, we still have some environmental uh, problems here as well. And so I'm just here to kind of garner information as to maybe how we can make our church a little greener. Okay, so Lucy, do you have, do you, uh, should I send you his email address at some point, okay? Absolutely, I would love to, I'm going to do a little blog post about all of these great initiatives. It's, they're, they're amazing. Um, uh, and, um, uh, in PEI, um, David McDonald is on our board. Martin, have you spoken to him um, about funding opportunities? No, I like I said, I'm just here in you know a little dinky part of the island. Uh, I'm fortunate enough the the major church that I have has about five and a half acres in size, so uh, we're quite open uh, to doing a lot of things here. Uh, but we do have a, a fairly large community garden and uh, it's very popular and if you go to our website you'll see pictures of, of it there like the food bank mental health association uh, my sunday school raises uh, crops to be sold at church from it uh, yes it's a big big project here uh, i should mention that you know in my previous life i actually have a diploma in agriculture i worked in ontario at ontario uh, United Cooperatives uh, before I went into ministry. So some of the bad things about agriculture are all the things I learned back in the 70s. And uh, we still have fish kills and runoff problems here in the province with corporate agriculture and the striving to get a 12 inch potato to make the perfect big long French fry. Yeah, that's a major problem here. Right. Okay, thank you. I can so one thing I would I would one one thing I, I, I would say is um, a lot of funders are interested in food security and interested in the problem of um, how do we make our, our communities more resilient to climate extremes. And so sometimes um, looking at that angle rather than the greening angle um it is um uh is more uh more fruitful but um not to to use that pun uh talking about gardening but um there is also the ecology action center in halifax so i'll put you in touch martin with them and they might be able to brainstorm with you great i should tell you some of the positive things too of course we have a sizable amish community that's just moved in here which is really great that's great. And uh, one third of our electrical energy in the province comes from wind. And it's moving up every year. So uh, if there's a lot of good things. There's still just some negative things that are still floating around. Yeah, great. So Neil, I'd like to come back to you. Um, and um, I'm wondering if you would um, be willing to um, Kind of take us on a bit more of a journey around the work that you're doing um, and it sounds really interesting that you have um, a, this, a church that is um, sounds like it's right next door to a park and you're kind of exploring this whole um, way of engaging um, both with the land and with the folk that are in the neighborhood around this so if you could share a bit more about that that would be great and maybe sure. what's, what's on the horizon for you yeah um, so it's, it's interesting. I get excited about this work because in, in many ways, um, if we can do it, everyone can do it. Mm. And so it's a powerful model, even though we are quite small. So um, what happened first? I, I realized that the church really needs to renew itself, not by placing its hope with the return 
to the numbers needed in worship to make the community viable, but in terms of um, common values around nature uh, and, and the environment and um, working together on that. So one of the things we did first was to hold a climate cafe and it was quite close to the climate, uh, Paris Climate Agreement and that has become a monthly event that uh, uh, attracts 20 to 40 people. We have different speakers each time, workshops, films. Um, it has a growing profile and it's introduced my community and myself to more political work, eco-activism. And so there are several, for example, wild spaces on the island of Montreal under threat. I've become uh, a member of the board of the Greek coalition. They meet um, uh, 20 months at our church. Um, and it's a bad year with this municipal election. Do not vote Kader if you could. Uh, the, it's a fairly unrepentant attitude towards wild space and a demonstration of the green washing or I might also say green wishing that is at level of municipal affairs, partly due to um, the wedding between um, income and developers. And if you can crack that one, I'd like to know where in Canada that municipal funding is not so dependent upon the profits can be made, made from developing land, which usually means the cheapest land, which usually means the wild space as opposed to brown uh, sites. So all of that, along with it, we, um, at this climate cafe, we asked people what sort of other ideas they might look at. And two emerged, one we've manifested, which is to have a co-op garden as of uh, four raised beds on the front lawn of the church. This is a very public space, about a thousand to 2000 people per day pass by the church. It's on a major cycle path right by the park and a recreational center. We actually were subject of a discussion at the council, the city council, <coughs> to, to do this because strictly speaking, these are structures that are not allowed on the, in the borough, in the city. So, but they waived that and uh, we're pleased to, and everyone smiles now. To see things grow in an urban context uh, where people have got limited access to land or their, even their terrace or, or their balcony is very small, just to see things grow from seed to fruit is a powerful thing. And, and it's brought people together. It's allowed seniors to garden because they don't have to bend over so much. And teens from the YMCA have worked with seniors as well on that. We also started having a, a faith in nature uh, moment in church. So every service now, instead of doing a children's talk, we don't, we have three children, but uh, before they arrived, I was doing this. Um, so now it's often a, a YouTube video and a short discussion. So for example, we had Moses story of the burning bush and I could show there actually is a burning bush that does burn without destroying itself. It's because the wax formed on the flowers. So it's a lovely crossover. And this is an attempt to integrate the work so that it's not just about a new initiative of outsiders coming involved in the church, but the congregation itself is growing in appreciation of their own faith in nature. So we're, we're keeping it all together. We had once a month uh, services, pet and plant services. Um, when the record, I think, was 13 dogs in one church service. Um, we found, though, that the dog owners only wanted to come for the blessing aspect, so they didn't come back. So, um, so we, we stopped that, but uh, we're going to bring it back because um, what else? the next stage for me was the offer from an, an environmental educator to bring Canadian Wildlife Federation resources to us. And I scratched my head and I said, well, where would we put it to show off this material and use it? And I suddenly realized we could move pews because our, our church is underused, the sanctuary. We could take out the transept, the, the west wing of the transept, take the pews out 
it's a 600 square foot area and it's empty uh, and now we've got growing amounts of plants and a hydroponic system called a nutri tower uh, which we we use to teach people how things grow why does it work well light and nutrients and circulation and more um, you can use it a lot to teach basic things about why things grow and how they grow um, is this, Neil, is this in your sanctuary? Yes, it is. It's like having wow. an angel in the corner. <laughs> we, we do turn it off for some things, for some worship things. Uh, we've got a second one that's right in the lobby of the church, which is really dark. It was a walk-through place. And now it's totally bright because of this Nutri Tower. If you Google Nutri Tower, you'll find the company that do it. Sister company to the one, Urban Seedlings, that did the co-op garden. And so for, we got two for the price of one because we're friendly with them all and the West Mounters. And um, uh, it's transformed that space. We've got a nice large post now saying, welcome to um, West Mount Park United Church, Living Church, Faith in Nature Center. And the Living Church comes from another partner the nearby a college, Dawson College, which is the largest college in Quebec, Anglophone that have a mature process now of becoming the first um, carbon neutral college in Quebec. We're, given they're the largest, that's a major achievement. And it's the result of over 10 years work from Chris Adam, the main sustainability uh, professor there. And they've branded themselves as living campus. So in partnership said, Neil, call yourself living church. And it really fits. Um, so, so we've got this. I'll just give you, if you could kind of take about 30 more seconds. Yep. And then Love I'll it. make sure we move on and give Jewel and Lucy also a chance. Right. To so we've just appointed a, a 10 hour a week animator curator to teach all ages. We're starting with the beavers and cubs and the seniors that are on our premises uh, about nature and the environment, particularly plants, because he's a plant scientist and we've got the Nutri Tower and they're easier than dogs and um, we're looking a major next thing will be to develop a green roof with maybe a cafe on the roof it's big capital investments it would be one hundred and fifty thousand dollars at least uh, but it would perhaps become um, an educative cafe they'll have one of the best views in Westmount um, and with examples of solar power or wind power, exhibiting good practice, engaging the local community, that we're in this together. And so the church becomes ecclesia, a meeting point around faith in nature. So if anyone has any ideas about capital funding for that, it's an exciting project uh, and really achievable. And many churches have got flat roofs too that could follow this. Wow, exciting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really exciting. Hey, okay. Um, so, well, I'm really finding a lot in common with the previous speakers, but one thing I didn't really introduce my name is Jewel Asterisk, and I am executive director for Keepers of the Athabasca. Um, I'm calling from Slave Lake, Alberta which is about two and a half hours north of Edmonton, just for an idea of, of where it is. Um, I wanted to say to Lucy, uh, I love the idea of the, the worship through biking, bicycling. And not only are you uh, making spirit stronger, but also making your body stronger as you go. So <laughs> way to go on the, uh, on the biking. Um, we do a lot of uh, food and energy sovereignty uh, projects with in partnership with First Nations um, most recently with um, Beaverly Cree Nation uh, if you go on our website keepers of the water slash Athabasca you can see the video about our solar project there and uh, they also were able to um, through some grants, we pointed them in the direction where they could be fruitful and they, they got an orchard. That was uh, what their garden team, because when we did our, our Save the Future meetings is how we uh, phrase the uh, community 
meetings that decide on on food and energy sovereignty projects and we form four teams during the meetings and those teams go out in the community and do research to find out what types of projects people want and in the garden team's case it was an orchard and and they were able uh, to get 80 fruit trees and a couple hundred uh, berry bushes in their schoolyard so um, did you say 80 80 yes 80 eight zero eight zero and and they have a an automatic drip water system and this was all in, in um, done with the school the MISC school uh, where we put the solar panels as well and so the training team uh, went out in the community and recruited 20 people who were interested in getting solar uh, technologist training and so we uh, were able to work with our solar installation company to um, make sure that training was provided and they actually assisted with the installation so that was great um this but, year we're but, working really sorry is is your solar um installation company indigenous led no what we did was a request for proposals and we put that out to at the time there were 61 installation companies in alberta that in, that do solar installations and um one of the two of them uh, have indigenous people involved one is owned by a metis fellow um, but the community decide which bids to choose so um, and actually they didn't submit a bid mm -hmm. so um, they they weren't involved in the actual um, contract itself but the community now is itself trained and uh, so this year we're, we're working with Sucker Creek First Nation along the same template uh, it will be our last um, project that we are funding though because in the meantime we were able through our partnership with Alberta Green Economy Network to um, achieve uh, a, a lobbying victory which has actually never happened in Alberta before to my knowledge that an environment group gets what they asked for but uh, we got the uh, Indigenous Solar Program and the government pays 80% of upfront costs to install uh, solar equipment. So over the next two years, we're going to be uh, do, doing workshops called Community Climate Action and uh, encouraging uh, not just First Nations, but any Aboriginal organization can apply for this funding. So uh, we'll be uh, promoting that program uh, along with uh, how to prepare for climate change and how to be a resilient community and and uh, know what to look for when the wind starts up because we we are seeing incredible uh, climate change effects here in Alberta we had a what they call a plow wind during the summer in Red Deer and at the same time we had a bunch of what they are calling micro bursts so these are all new things um, knocked down a heck of a lot of forest and uh, knocked over a canoe and killed a guy so it's this is happening it's all happening now yeah well thank you so much jewel lots of really exciting things happening could go so much more depth there so i'm I, i'd like to um also move um to lucy and uh, perhaps you could share some more about the work that you're doing i know we had a very brief conversation about some of the work you're doing with um uh, kind of historic buildings and some of that piece. So that would be really interesting to hear about as well. So yeah, we, um, uh, and first of all, just, I'm, I just want to climb through the lines and, and hug you guys and just be able to hang out together because it's so inspiring to hear everything that, what everyone is doing. Um, so in, we, we found, so we've been doing um, this work for about 10 years and I, and I should, or over 10 years, and I should say I operate out of a social incubation site in Chinatown. I have a, what's called a hot desk. Our communications person is in Hamilton, Ontario. Our, we're all part-time. Um, so we're about building networks. And our chapters around the country are typically based out of environmental organizations. Um, so we work with the Ecology Action Center, for example, in Halifax. Um, and we help them raise money to focus on outreach to faith communities. 
Um, so I would, um, we're all about kind of networking and matchmaking and just trying to build up the strength of, of the sector. So, um, so feel free to get in touch anytime you have requests uh, for support. That's what our, that's what our mandate is. Um, in answer to, to um, Sarah's question, we were finding um, more and more that a lot of faith communities were saying to us, oh, we'd love to green. Um, we'd love your, your programs, um, but we don't know if we're going to be around in five to 10 years. Um, and so we, we called it the elephant in the room um, to talk about um, environment without talking about this existential crisis of survival. And so we've been challenging ourselves to change our mandate to, um, to, to look at triple, uh, uh, triple bottom line sustainability, or as the edge likes to say, quadruple bottom line sustainability. And, um, that, um, and that has led us to this program about regenerating and repurposing faith buildings. And you could say that's the highest form of sustainability is making sure we're not tearing down the buildings, these existing buildings. Um, so we have partners, we're partners with the National Trust for Canada, um, and they, um, I, I don't know, has anyone heard of the National Trust for Canada? Um, usually when you say heritage to, uh, to people who are dealing with faith buildings, they, they want to hit you, um, because it's such a noose kind of heritage designation for faith buildings, but we have found that they're great partners um, in trying to work with um, the, the 27,000 faith buildings across Canada. And many of those have heritage designations. And even if they don't have heritage designations, their communities consider them to be um, part of the heritage of the communities themselves. Um, so kind of informally. So, um, uh, so I would just say that, um, that um, there, we have found that there are great allies um, uh, among the heritage community and there's funding oftentimes in the heritage community um, uh, uh, to, uh, to repurpose and um, uh, retrofit um, faith buildings to, to make them more uh, sustainable. Um, May I ask? Sure. Uh, to what extent um, Quebec is excluded from that? Well, uh, well, Quebec has got their own house in order in a way that the rest of the country does not. So I, I the question, so um, and my French is really horrible, Neil. So um, the they, the Quebec uh, the Quebec government has already set set aside millions of dollars for repurposing and regenerating faith buildings. I don't know if United Anglo United Churches can can access that. We, we're in a little bit of a political situation just now. Ironically, the Liberal rather than the PQ government downgraded uh, the heritage grants, and in the, those cuts, I think, um, in the name of uh scarcity or whatever uh of men anglophone buildings being downgraded mm. but we're in process we are actually uh trying to generate a friends of the church group around heritage because we are a heritage building there's no doubt about it we have the world's best collection of an artist's works it, uh, 13 stained glass by the same person so I'd be happy to talk to you, uh, put right. you in touch with our partners, um, because perhaps that would be a source of funding um, for you all to, to kind of um, conservation or um, Canadian heritage and conservation funds. And I'm not an expert on that, but we have really terrific partners at the National Trust, and they're all um, bilingual and, and, and understand the obstacles um, in Quebec as well as in other Francophone communities. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, it, it's for me, and just when I listen to everyone, gosh, it all boils down to partners. Like we've got to get out of this privatized view of our faith worlds and get into the communities and um, and 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 work together. That's where um, our, our our hope lies and inspire each other. Um, 
So I, um, if you were to ask me about a recipe for success, regardless of whether you're talking about advocacy or retrofitting your building or community uh, gardens, I would say, you know, investing in building partners, strong partnerships across the community. So I'm curious, um, thank you for that, Lucy, very much. And I'm curious about, I mean, I love the way you um, have kind of um, uh, embraced the elephant in the room and uh, speaking to the existential crisis of the churches about whether they're going to be there in five years or not. So how, how exactly, have, what, what have you been, how have you been doing that piece? So um, we, um, uh, we're, for example, uh, I'll just give you an example. We're working with um, a Presbyterian church in uh, Hamilton, Hamilton called St. Paul's Presbyterian. And they are, um, uh, they, they are trying to figure out what their future is, how their, their congregation is dwindling. They're in a beautiful old uh, historic building that they can no longer afford um, uh, to support. And um, so they don't know what to do. They could sell it off to a developer and do very well. Um, but to their credit, they are trying to figure out if they can repurpose this building really as a community center. So we are working with them um, to facilitate conversations, very similar, I think, to what the EDGE does with the United Church, with a lot of United Church communities. Um, uh, so we're facilitating conversations conversations about um, kind of asset-based community development. So what do, what are they what are they what can they bring to the community? Why does the community value them? How can they um, think about strong uh, rental partnerships? Um, um, perhaps shared sanctuary usage? Um, what kind of um, uh, who are who are their neighbors? Hospitals, schools. What kind of what are their space requirements? Is this faith building um, responding to those community um, requirements? Um, I know that Rob at um, at the Edge often says that kind of community roundtables should be part of your regular rituals as a faith community, and I absolutely. Um, agree with that. Too many of us don't really know what's happening um, with our neighbors, and 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 I, I think um, churches tend to be pretty good about working ecumenically, but um, but there are huge opportunities to work interfaith, of course, um, as well. And I think um, th that um, you know, I, I think when we think about sustainability and faith buildings, um, we should all be challenging ourselves to use this metric of um, maximizing the usage of our buildings. Um, you can have a very low carbon footprint, um, an environmental footprint, um, uh, if your building is only used once a week um, and then it stays closed. So w we should challenge ourselves to um, to ensure that um, we're we're maximizing the 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 the, the utilization uh, of these buildings. Great, thank you. So at this point, I'd like to kind of open it up for um, resonances, questions um, amongst us, whether it's the um, presenters or um, uh, the participants on the call. Um, things that you'd like to comment on that you've heard. Further questions you'd like to ask, Jewel. Thanks. Um, I really uh, feel that the uh, the discussion around greeting the church buildings resonates with me in terms of what the elders said about what happens on the land because uh, churches do own a lot of land and uh, these buildings are incredible resources and um, especially like uh, Neil was talking about his um, Nutra Tower and how it has brought light to a dark place and it's like a uh, an example and uh, um, uh, a, a learning tool for for people in the community they they wouldn't even need necessarily to belong to the church but if they go to see the Nutra Tower then you know the interest could grow from there and um, 
just talking about the the spaces that that churches occupy in relationship to um, what's going on on the land like it's it's important to remember that everything that we have and and use and all of our commodities and our our, our buildings and our technology all does eventually come from the land like it, it all of it comes from the land and and so how we how we address the tragedy of the commons where where um, uh, green space is worth less than than brown yeah. space that that has to be part of it as well because we've already impacted the brown fields and we have a responsibility to to uh, to make sure that they're utilized, uh, remediated, whatever needs to be done. There's so many examples of brownfields and some really, really highly toxic that are not being addressed, that are not being looked at. Um, just because people are turning the other way, they don't really want to deal with it. But before any green space is used, definitely those those brownfields have got to be addressed. That's just, uh, that's our responsibility because we already impacted them. I, have to, I could say there's an economic uh, crisis in all of this, um, well documented about how the present economic ideology, and it is an ideology, that is the problem, um, of uh, global capital, of large investors, of developers knowing um, that that world in which they can make cash gains irrespective of the good or bad uh, outcome of their actions and the detachment because of the nature of money and capital and capitalism um, the detachment from land from people's well-being has reached a crisis point when i was at mcgill i was quite shocked I, I took a, an interest in green economics to find economic professors telling me themselves that their profession was bankrupt. It's a good expression, huh? That actually um, the abstraction that has occurred within classic economic theory is the problem. It's, it's a false construction. And so we we're not there yet at all and there's huge resistance to actually have an economic system that bears re an attachment to reality um, and it's it's the nature of money that's partly to blame um, there's a great book sacred economics um, which sums up how uh, for example in in the banknote with in Britain, I get, yeah, it's in Britain, uh, I promised to bear the bearer of this one pound sterling. And so the banknote shows you money is about the creation of debt. In the creation of the bank note, the queen indebts herself. And, um, and so it goes on from that, the detachment of the system, an economic system, from the basic realities and um, there's a sense of doom in all of this uh, in the green work that that we've not yet found a way to change collectively sufficiently well that we can say our great-grandchildren are going to flourish there's a sense of doom which which um, is a paradoxic thing that the more you learn the more you get concerned about it the more you send off an alarm and the more you can feel quite isolated. And some of the work I think we do that's very valuable is simply gather people together who would otherwise probably be quite depressed. But when you come together and you learn about what's happening and what's the great changes that are being done, you find more hope. Um, yeah. So economics, that's a key, a key th picture in all of this. So what I hear you saying is is about the tragedy of the commons that those who bear responsibility don't feel that responsibility and and those who are feeling the responsibility don't actually have the power to change uh, the ones who are going ahead with the development on Greenland type of thing. Yeah, so 
wondering if there's a way we can address that. Can we partner with those people? Because this is a transformational time when people are divesting from things that we don't want and investing in things that we do want. And is there is there any way to bring that pressure to those who actually do bear responsibility? I've not seen yet an adequate discussion of alternative models of municipal funding. That, yeah, that would be interesting. I, I guess I would, um, um, I, I think there are ways, I mean, I think what, you're, what you've been doing, Julie, your food and energy sovereignty project, where you're closing the circle, um, you're making sure that your environmental, um, your community needs and the, the environmental goals, you're, you're hiring businesses that are serving those needs so you're it, it's you're creating an economic engine of sustainable low carbon um uh production and and i think faith communities are uniquely positioned to do that so for example um why um we, we were looking at um uh, uh why why can't faith communities hire retrofit providers that are committed to um, kind of low carbon principles, number one, but hiring difficult to employ people, number two. Why, why can't our environmental goals um, be used to address our social goals? Or certainly what you're talking about with this massive problem of reconciliation. You know, why aren't we using our environmental goals uh, to address some of these other issues. And we, as communities of faith, are called to do that. There's a moral calling for us to do that. So we have an extra impetus beyond profit that we can use to push our institutions um, forward. At least that's the theory. Um, but I think there's, um, we're at a point of desperation now and at a point of crisis where there, people are listening now in a new way and, and, and we need to be more creative and entrepreneurial as faith communities and, and, and not give up. Great, so I'm gonna um, kind of interject here. So this conversation has been extremely rich and I'd love to take Neil and Jewel and Lucy on a road show. I think you guys are <laughs> totally dynamic together and you've got such great ideas and you're doing such good work. Um, I think it would be totally inspiring for people to, um, to kind of know this um, and and to see how they might kind of um, take some of it and download pieces of it in their own context. So I really just, I, I, that would be, what I'm moving towards is doing a bit of a checkout, which is a, a ritual we have as part of these calls where people can kind of say what's the gift, what's the appreciation, what's top of mind for them as we kind of conclude our time together. And uh, so that would be mine, just really valuing the work that you're doing and your courage and creativity um, and compassion in stepping out and, and um, weathering the uncomfortableness that it brings in terms of hope, despair, um, mm. where's God in this and how do we take the next step. But uh, so just really I'm appreciating so much what you're doing. So I'll, I'll, that would be my checkout. So I'd like to open it up. Um, we have a, just a few minutes, so we can't take super long for this, but um, invite each of you to, to kind of say, what's top of mind? What are you taking away from this call today? Neil, would you like to go first? Yes. Um, I'd like to thank Jewel for her stories uh, and um, mm -hmm. actions. And I, I find encouragement uh, in the um, resistance you your Pressing towards the bitumen, bitumen mine, um, mm -hmm. and in that story, it's real resonance with the way in which wild space is being destroyed in in Montreal. Um, and I'm in solidarity with you there, and it encourages me to do what we can here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and for Lucy, I, I'm I'm empowered to uh, feel that in the networking that you've got, there are rich pickings for us and hopefully we can actually uh, also inspire other people uh, by what we can do in our small way uh, in this church. The church is uh, full of good things. We've even fossils in the, in the rocks of the, in the, in the stones of the church building to teach people from. And it's a theme, uh, stained glass windows with flowers and nature that nobody noticed before. Now we're doing the theme, they pop out 
So it's a sort of talent parable, what's there. So I think, I hope we'll participate in your network and, and help others. Great. Wow. Yeah, um, I, uh, I just would, um, uh, re just Doug and Martin and, and Jewel and Neil, uh, um, really just so inspiring to hear what everyone is doing. And, and I know, you know, I think we all know, like, it, it's lonely. <laughs> Like oftentimes it's quite lonely work. And um, so I'm grateful that we're coming together to encourage each other. And, um, and I, you know, um, I, I, I think maybe the one thing that, that I just keep popping into my mind is that how many, if um, there, there is kind of such anxiety out there um, about this issue, especially among our fellow, our fellow advocates and protectors, and um, and I think um, I, I always think uh, that uh, we should be partnering with some of these environmental, secular environmental organizations, and uh, helping each other. At maybe uh, help with rituals and um, un unearth the kind of our, our spiritual centers, and and follow in the footsteps of the amazing work that. Uh, uh, so, so many indigenous communities are already doing um, on the, on this kind of the, the spiritual side of all this environmental work that we've been so crap at for so many years um, as the Judeo-Christian tradition. So anyway, um, I'm never going to be invited back because I can't bloody shut up. So anyway, I will stop there. <laughs> Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to really thank everyone uh, for being on the call. That's my, the gift that I'm taking away is just meeting you guys and uh, knowing about yet more people who are out there doing, doing the good stuff. So that's right on. I'm going to try and show you a water ceremony that we did. Um, can you see the water ceremony? Not yet. Oh. It's it's a slow like it's some it's, for some reason it's quite slow. Oh, oh. there we go. It's coming. It's coming. Oh, yeah. is that the paddlers you're seeing or the water ceremony? Looks like paddlers. Oh. Okay, those are <laughs> there paddlers. There's the water ceremony. Nice. I hope. Um, so yeah, we did this on Canada Day, and and you know that's what really started the discussion for keepers because we. Um, our indigenous led but our board is about half and half and so half of us were saying well how can we take money for Canada Day we can't celebrate that and the other half were saying well no we'll celebrate the river we'll get people back on Canada's original highways and uh, you, you've inspired me we've got a, a concrete made pond that's uh, emptied it in in the winter <laughs> that's how bad it is <laughs> but it's based on a natural water course but it would be lovely. You've just given me a good idea to do something like that in, in our little park. I encourage you to contact uh, your local First Nations for uh, in, uh, additional inspiration and to meet them and to invite them uh, perhaps to assist um, in, in these types of ceremonies, which are Excellent. traditional yeah. uh, First Nations ceremonies. Um, yeah, we, we're, we're going to do this again next year, uh, we hope, and um, hopefully there'll be more than, these are 11 paddlers. Uh, Nancy is our elder from Cold Lake First Nation. She didn't paddle, but we're trying, we're going to try for a, a short leg next time. So we'll, we'll add uh, just a two hour paddle just at the very end for people who want to join and aren't able to do the full three days. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll keep it going. That was a very, very intense discussion on our board that led us to the flowing into right relationship concept. And we actually um, are also going to have a workshop series that we're presenting, uh, flowing into right relationship workshops. And we're going to be examining the treaty documents. We're going to be um, examining the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in workshop and uh, seeing how people can participate in their own way in their own home and and also of course the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action so yeah this is all what's coming up over the next two years and uh, we can keep in touch excellent yeah. great thank you um, Martin and Doug would you like to check out
Sure. Sure. I, I, this has been great. I, I, uh, I really like the concept that Jewel brought up that there's something before reconciliation can happen because we're on the boards that I'm on struggling with that. We have with the camp a pretty strong relationship with some of the local indigenous people. So we, with those groups. So, uh, we were looking at how we could do it and this is before we've even met with someone. So it's kind of uh, a great concept that there's work before reconciliation that I'm going to look into a little more and, and talk to them about, um, for, and the other pieces too, with the, uh, the economics of it, where, uh, we have been, you know, the camps need money, churches need money, that kind of thing. The, uh, somebody came up with the concept, well, why don't we just sell one of the camps and we'll spread that money around and then you'll all be fine. But, uh, we managed to to talk them out of that, and the same thing in talking them out of selling a small church because it doesn't have as many like in a small community because it's not making money. It wasn't losing money, but it's not making money. Uh, so uh, those kind of battles, I think, are setting up all those kind of partnerships that were talked about, and uh, we're we've been successful so far with that kind of keeping the communities open, keeping the camps with the land and, and getting more into, if you look at the camps, the youth ministry of the United church, there are more young kids at camps than there are in our churches in most cases. So, so we have that audience to, to uh, influence and work with. So this was great. Thanks. I'm going to listen to it again because I didn't get all the notes here. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Martin. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for supplying sermon material for Sunday. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That's a project. Again, yeah, guaranteed <laughs> to put your congregation to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I enjoy uh, appreciating the, uh, the hope that's expressed because I have to tell you in all honest truth, there's a lot of negativism out there and it, sometimes it can be overwhelmingly depressing and uh, so it's nice to see you know positive projects going forth and having their impact so it's one of the reasons I listen in so it just cheers me up <laughs> right well thank you everybody it's been such a pleasure and hopefully we will um, reconnect and um, I'm actually working with edge on kind of um this online conversation 2.0 to look about how we might kind of take this forward. And of course, my hope would be that um, we would have a larger audience. I love the intimacy of this and it would just be so wonderful to be able to share the stories and the energy that you are bringing to more folks. So I think that's part of the project that I'm working on um, with Edge. So we'll see how that plays out. But thank you so much for joining us. This has been so rich and um, inspiring. Lots of goodness. So thank you. And maybe we can just wave to say goodbye. And hopefully we'll see one another soon. And um, I'm assuming it's okay to connect you, to share email addresses. Is that Please. Good with yeah. that? Great. Good. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank My you. Pleasure. Okay. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.